now. I want to start with Mel Goodman in Washington. Uh, long years at the Central Intelligence Agency and the State Department. Uh, you've just written an op-ed piece in the Baltimore Sun that looks at these two top transition officials. Explain who they are and what they represent. Well, I think it's important to understand who John Brennan is. He Uh, where we seem to have lost the sound, um, Mel Goodman. Let's see if we uh, if we have it back. Mel, can you hear us? Can you hear me? Uh, hi, can you hear us, Mel Goodman? I, I can hear you. Fine, okay, good. Now we I'm, hear you fine. So just start from the top. Talk okay, about Brennan. John, John Brennan was deputy executive secretary to George Tenet during the worst violations during the, the CIA period in the run-up to the Iraq War. So he sat there at Tenet's knee when they passed judgment on torture and abuse, on extraordinary renditions, on black sites, on secret prisons. He was part of all of that decision-making. Jamie Missick was the deputy director for intelligence during the run-up to the Iraq War. So she, she went along with the phony intelligence estimate of October 2002, the phony white paper that was prepared by Paul Pilar in October 2002. Uh, she helped with the drafting of the speech that Colin Powell gave to the United Nations in February of 2003, which made the phony case for war to the international community. So when George Tenet said, slam dunk, we can provide all the intelligence uh, you need, to the president in December of 2002, it was people like Jamie Missick and John Brennan who were part of the team who provided that phony intelligence. Uh, so what I think people at the CIA are worried about, and I've talked to many of them over the weekend, is that there will never be any accountability uh, for these violations and some of the unconscionable acts uh, committed at the CIA, which essentially amount to war crimes when you're talking about torture and abuse in secret prisons. So where are we in terms of change? This sounds like more continuity. I want to turn to excerpts from a December 2005 interview with John Brennan, the former CIA official now leading Obama's intelligence transition. Brennan was interviewed by Margaret Warner on the NewsHour with Jim Lehrer about his views on the Bush administration's practice of extraordinary rendition. So was Secretary Rice correct today when she called it a vital tool in combating terrorism? I think it's an absolutely vital tool. I have been intimately familiar now over the past decade with the cases of rendition that the U.S. government has been involved in, and I can say without a doubt that it has been very successful as far as producing intelligence that has saved lives. So is it, are you saying both in two ways, both in getting terrorists off the streets and also in the interrogation? Yes. The rendition is the, is the practice or the process of rendering somebody from one place to another place. It is moving them, and U.S. government will frequently facilitate that movement from a country to another. Why would you not, if, this, if you have a suspect who is a danger to the United States, keep, it, keep him in United States custody? Is it because we want another country to do the dirty work. No, I don't think that's it at all. Also, I think it's rather arrogant to think that we're the only country that respects human rights. I think that we have a lot of assurances from these countries that we hand over terrorists to that they will, in fact, respect human rights. And there are different ways to gain those assurances. But also, let's say an individual goes to Egypt because they're an Egyptian citizen. And the Egyptians then have a longer history in terms of dealing with them. And they have family members and others that they can bring in, in fact, to be part of the whole interrogation process. That's John Brennan, who heads up the uh, transition team on intelligence. Mel Goodman? Well, John Pre Brennan is being completely dishonest there. Uh, all of the operational people I've talked to know that the people who were turned over to the Arab intelligence services, and remember, this is Egypt, this is Syria, this is Jordan, this is Saudi Arabia, uh, that all of these foreign intelligence services uh, commit torture and abuse. Now, if any of these suspects had anything to say to us that was of any utility, we would have kept them. Uh, we would have controlled these people. They would have become our sources uh, and our assets. Uh, when we turned them over, we were turning over people who fe we felt had very little to offer, and we were turning over them to them to the uh, Arab Liaison Services uh, for torture and abuse. Uh, John Brennan has defended the warrantless eavesdropping. John Brennan has basically defended all of the violations that were committed at the CIA in the run-up to the war and in the post-war uh, period. So the signal this sends to CIA employees who tried to get it right, and there were a few who tried to get it right, uh, is the worst kind of signal. And if this 
is Obama's judgment uh, about a national security team, it's very reminiscent of what Bill Clinton did in 1993 when he appointed people such as Jim Wilsey uh, and um, Les Aspen and Warren Christopher and Tony Lake to the national security positions, and all of them had to be removed uh, before the first term was over. So this is very disquieting, what we're learning now. In fact, NPR attributed Obama's reversal on FISA and telecom immunity to the fact that he was relying on the advice of John Brennan, uh, an emphatic supporter of these policies. Well, then you have to wonder who he's relying on in terms of advice to keep Bob Gates uh, at the Pentagon, which I think is another example of continuity uh, and not change. You mean you're, to tell me that, that there are no Democrats who are qualified to become the Secretary of Defense? Bob Gates has supported all of the policies that Obama said he was going to look at very carefully and seemed to oppose. Uh, expansion of NATO, bringing Georgia and Ukraine into NATO, deployment of missiles in Poland, deployment of radars in the Czech Republic, uh, the continued acquisition of a national missile defense, which is the most expensive item in the Pentagon's procurement project, an, an item that we've spent over $500 billion on in the last 40 uh, years. This is, again, this is not change. This is continuity. Michael Ratner, as you listen to John Brennan again heading up the transition team on intelligence, your thoughts? Well, it's extremely, extremely disturbing. When you read Jane Mayer's book, the worst and most onerous chapter is the chapter on what the CIA did to people in secret sites, from small coffins to waterboarding. John Brennan was there at the time. Uh, to hear him say that this stuff works is really remarkable, or there's, it's, it's very important to do, is really remarkable. It's that this, he's saying that at the same time when we know about the center's client, Maha Arar, being sent to Syria, tortured, so-called diplomatic assurances somehow able to protect him, uh, another Guantanamo people, other Guantanamo people sent to Egypt with the worst kind of torture. So the idea uh, that Brennan, uh, who should probably, along with Tennant, be facing some kind of war crimes trial, uh, is actually heading the transition on this is extremely disturbing. And Jamie Missick, Mel Goodman, uh, talk about Jamie Missick her was the deputy director. She was the deputy director of intelligence during the run-up to the war and in the immediate post-war period. That was a period of politicized intelligence. That was a period of the corruption of the process. That was a period when all analytic tradecraft, all of the rules of analytic tra tradecraft uh, were ignored. She passed judgment on the October 2002 estimate. She passed on the white paper, which was the phony paper that violated the CIA charter because it took classified material and then declassified it and sent it to the Congress only days before the vote on the authorization to use force in Iraq in October 2002. She was part of the slam dunk team that George Tenet was so proud of that prepared a phony, est uh, not, the, not only that phony estimate, but the speech that Colin Powell gave, that outrageous speech with 28 allegations, all of them false, prepared in February of 2003, which was the case to the international community. Hundreds of millions of people heard that phony speech, and it's still an embarrassment to, to Colin Powell to this very day. She was part of the team that allowed George Bush to go before this country in January of 2003 in the State of the Union address and use a fabricated intelligence report to say that Iraq was getting in ur rich uranium from a West African uh, country. Jamie Missick was a part of all of this, and a lot of us were very pleased when Porter Goss actually fired Jamie Missick. My guess is he probably fired her for the wrong reasons and not the right reasons, but we were glad to see her go. Uh, and now for Obama to turn around, put Jamie Missick back in the CIA in transition and Brennan in the transition process, and then, then you look at people such as the former deputy lieutenant, John McLaughlin, who was also an intelligence advisor, and Rob Risher, who was a key operations advisor, who was the deputy to Jose Rodriguez, uh, who's now being investigated by the Justice Department for the illegal... Uh, destruction of the torture tapes. You know, you have to wonder uh, who is Obama relying on for advice on the Washington community? He's only been in Washington, we know, for two years, and obviously there are things he needs to know about national security, the CIA, and the intelligence community, and obviously he's listening to the wrong people. Mel Goodman, I want to thank you for being with us, former CIA and State Department analyst. Uh, his latest book is called Failure of Intelligence, The Decline and Fall of the CIA. 